Hello, everyone. This is Nairi from Low Carbon Fasting. Well, our guest today is um, an author, the author of several uh, diet and uh, health related books, and I will mention them uh, during the podcast. She is um, a nutritionist and nutrition researcher and um, speaker on public health issues. She's from Wales, United mm -hmm. Kingdom, very close to my heart. And some of you may know my husband is from Wales. So uh, um, I'm proud to have a Welsh guest on today. She is Dr. Zoe Harcum from Wales, as I said. Welcome to Low Carbon Fasting. Thank you very much for having me. It's very kind. Thank you. Dr. Harcum, you studied in Cambridge University and you had uh, your degrees in um, mathematics and uh, economics. What then got you to do your PhD in human nutrition? Okay, I'll give you a really fast history on that one. I mean, first of all, you only do you do one single subject at Cambridge. So I took the entrance exam on maths, and then very, very quickly changed to economics, but you could do all the maths options. Um, so I always kind of say economics with maths in case people start thinking you did PPE and can talk about philosophy and politics and all that kind of thing, which I can't, I'm very much math, stats, econometrics, um, microeconomics, that, that was my bag. So at Cambridge, I just became completely fascinated by the obesity epidemic because it was starting to take off and it, it was starting to take off in the UK um, in the 80s and sort of then heading into the 90s. And I just fascinated by it because nobody wants to be overweight, let alone obese. And yet, you know, I could see my mum had switched to lower fat products um, as I was sort of heading off to university. And then people started talking more about low fat and um, the first sugar free drinks started coming in, um, which were completely disgusting. Um, you know, it didn't taste like they do now. So the, the, the world was sort of changing around me. And I, I was very much of, um, you know, the, the generation that people can remember that there was one overweight person in your class. And you can remember who that person was because it was so rare. And then suddenly, by the time my mum finished school teaching, half the class was overweight. Um, and it's sort of, you know, how did that happen kind of thing. So I just, I, I became completely fascinated by obesity because you smoke because you enjoy it. Apparently it's pleasurable, I've never smoked. Um, I know we eat because we enjoy it, but nobody wants to be overweight or obese. And if it really were as simple as just eat less, do more, then we'd all do it. So there were, it's my maths logic, it, it just wasn't adding up. Um, so I became fascinated by it there and it was just kind of in the back of my mind. I then went and had a, a you know, normal career, proper job as my mum would call it, um, went into management consultancy, um, then started working for Mars, um, which has got Mars confectionery, Mars pet food, but it also had an electronics division, which is where I worked. Um, great company to work for, just, you know, shame about the products a little bit. Moved from Mars to Smith Klein Beecham. So I went from big food to big pharma, basically. Um, so it kind of showed me from the inside how those sort of big entities work. But all the way in the background, while I was doing these jobs, there was just this ongoing fascination with um, why people overeat, why people are obese. And then I actually got the opportunity to write a book while I was, I worked my way up to HR director at sort of a global level. And in one of the organizations that I worked for, I was on a training course. Um, it, it, we were all sort of making a commitment to what we were going to do to to be different when we left the training course. Otherwise, there's no point having gone on the course. And I remember saying to the person that I was buddied up with, oh, I've got a book that I really want to write, but I just know I won't because I just don't have time. Um, and the trainer just happened to be walking past me when I said that. And the trainer said, I hope you don't mind me saying, but I've heard you talking about Big Brother. Um, which was the TV show that had just come out at the time. He said, if you've got time to watch Big Brother, you've got time to write a book. And I thought, mm, you're spot on, actually. And I just remember getting up in the morning um, before going off to be an HR director, just setting the alarm a couple of hours earlier, creeping down in the early hours, sitting in front of the Arga, writing and setting myself targets. And then suddenly, spring 2004, I had a book um, called Why Do You Overeat When All You Want Is To Be Slim? So... That's kind of how the two careers went in parallel. And then about 2008, when the financial world kind of imploded, like many executives, I got the opportunity to leave the organization and do something else. And that's when I decided I wanna see if I can make what I'm passionate about my, what I do, 
Um, and that's when I left and started researching, writing, did a PhD, um, wrote more books, um, that kind of thing. And that and that's kind of what I do. You know, it doesn't pay what an HR director pays, but it's just much more fun and rewarding and um, yeah, just much more fulfilling, much more worthwhile. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it changes people's lives. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. So all of what we do does that, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I've learned so much from your presentations. In fact, I had one of my aha moments was when I was listening to your presentation on uh, on fiber and okay. how essential or, or not not non essential it is in in human nutrition. And I went. This explains most of the um, um, the troubles I was experiencing at the time. And of course I was vegetarian, mm. I vegetarian for 30, 30 plus years. Um, mm. And then I, I heard you talking about fiber and I thought I've got to do something about this. <laughs> and of course, the only thing you can do about it is if you're a vegetarian, then you've got, you've got to start eating meat, but you can relate to that because you've been vegetarian as well. Yeah, I, I was veggie for about 20 years. I can still very much empathize with the desire to be vegetarian. Still the idea of eating an animal does not appeal to me. Um, you'll have had the same, you have people saying, oh, you you know, you just were so weak world, you just couldn't resist bacon. It's like, well, I, I don't eat bacon now. Um, it's not actually one of the things that I eat, but and I don't eat animals by choice, but I just recognize that that's where the nutrients are. And when you then look at the, environmental consideration you actually realize that ruminants particularly which is why i don't eat so much bacon i'm much more interested in cows and sheep because they're the ones giving back to the land and that we need those to be doing what they're doing so that we have the topsoil that we can then grow other vegetables in you know that should be a symbiotic relationship between growing some plants and growing some animals but eating the two And then you look into things like um, animal deaths in plant agriculture, and you look at those sort of combine harvesters that sweep across a field. I mean, you know, some of those are 50 metres wide. And I'm sorry, but they're hoovering up rabbits, um, voles, mice, birds, worms, snails, domestic cats, if you're unlucky, and they live near a field that's about to be ploughed and they don't get out of the way quickly enough. And there are billions, billions of animals killed in the name of grains and soy and vegetarian food. But you don't want to admit that when you're vegetarian because you've just got this idea in your head that I'm not eating animals um, and therefore what I'm doing is okay. And there's there's, there's real sort of denial and, and I had to get to the point where I couldn't carry on deluding myself in that way. And, and actually some people will say you're better off, you know, a cow can feed um, a person for a year um, the grains that you would have to consume and the animals that would have been killed in the production of those grains, let alone the water diversion, rivers and whatever diversions that go on to irrigate those fields that then kill fish and herons and animals that live around water. You know, it's just, the knock on consequences are just enormous. But we just have this thing that, oh, if I don't actually put the thing in my mouth, then I didn't kill it. Um, you know, I did a bit of gardening this afternoon. I did my very best, but I know I've killed a snail. Um, you know, I, I, I could not do any gardening and, and and not have that unfortunate incident at some point or tread on a worm or something like that. It is, it, it's just life. We, we've we got to realise that we are part of this circle of life and that happens and, and that's how it is. Thank you for addressing that and the importance of um, meat and human nutrition. Well, let's elaborate on that a little, little further. What is it that meat, especially as you said, ruminant meat, gives us that we cannot get from plants? Because that, I mean, it may sound very sort of naive question, but a lot of vegetarians, I was one, believe that you can get the same nutrition from cauliflower and, and, and kale, yeah. for example. So what is it that we would be missing on a vegetarian or even um, worse, I would say, if that's the correct um, uh, word, on a vegan diet? Yeah, and and there is a difference. And like you, I had a penny drop moment. Mine was at a conference. I went to a Western Price conference in 2010, and I had the privilege of hearing Sally Fallon Morell who was the founder of the Western Price Movement, and she was speaking in London, and a guy called Barry Groves was speaking in London as well. And 
if you ever look into the work of Barry Groves, he was about 30 years ahead of his time. Um, he was writing why low carb needs to be high fat, not high protein. 30, 40 years ago. Um, incredible guy, I had the privilege and, and sadness of speaking at his funeral to give the nutrition eulogy. I mean, he really was extraordinary. So I heard those two presentations. And for me, it was vitamin A, because it was the first time that I realized that they came in two forms. Um, and you sort of think, well, you know, that, that's crazy. How did I not realize that before? But we don't get taught nutrition at school. Why would I realize that? You know, I, I went to school, I was studying um, Shakespeare and maths and end up at Cambridge, you know, when was somebody going to sit me down and teach me about vitamins and minerals? It's a crime that we don't learn about that at school. So Sally was talking about the fact that you've got the plant form of vitamin A, which is carotene, and you've got the animal form of vitamin A, which is retinol. And every time that nutrients come in two forms, so it happens with vitamin D as well, so you've got D2 that comes from plants, D3 that comes from animals, you've got K1 and K2, it's a little bit more complex because you can get some K2 from fermented foods. But essentially, whenever there's two forms, the body wants the animal form. And I was listening to this presentation and I had just had, had two eye operations in the sort of the past year at Moorfields Eye Hospital. And I was listening to Sally and I just suddenly realized they were completely and utterly unnecessary. They were completely and utterly my fault. And I just happen to be one of those people who is not good at converting carotene to retinol. But hey, guess what? A lot of people can't. It's not like it's rare, you, you know, maybe 25% of people. And actually, interestingly, it's higher in diabetics that you can't, you're not as good at converting from carotene to retinol. So I had basically retina, think retina of the eye, retinol, vitamin A. That's why we talk about vitamin A carrots, you know, being so good for, for eye health, but it's not carrots, it's, you know, that's the myth. What the body actually wants is liver because that's one of the most nutrient dense forms of retinol. So I mean, you just go through the vitamins. So there's 13 vitamins, you've got the four fat soluble vitamins. So A, you've got the animal plant form, you need the animal D, you need the animal E, comes in many, many different forms. And um, being honest, there are some, one of the most important plant um, forms of vitamin E is the plant um option which is sunflower seeds so you should have some sunflower seeds in your diet but they're not high carb and they're not um something you need to eat in large quantities and then vitamin k um, ideally animal foods if not fermented foods going to the b vitamins i mean just the richness that they present themselves in in animal foods but of course you've got b12 which is only found in animal foods so if you're vegetarian, you can get it from eggs and dairy. If you're vegan, you've got to get it from somewhere else. And the, the vegan society admit this. They will openly say you need to get vitamin B12 and ideally probably as an injection every few weeks, um, which is an absolute admission that your diet is, is, is not healthy and insufficient in nutrients. Then you get into the minerals, you'll struggle to get calcium, particularly as a vegan. Um, you can get it from dairy. Um, as a vegetarian, but not many people realize they think, oh, milk, cheese, really good source of calcium. Yeah, not bad, but oily fish is even better. Um, so you move into the minerals. Of course, you've got heme iron, which is the most easily absorbable form of iron that's exclusively found in red meat and seafood, not even um, really in chicken. You, you really want to be going for the <laughs> things that they demonize. Um, things like choline, egg yolks, um, you know, again, vegans would have a problem. But then you get into the essential nutrients. So as we know, you and I, there is no essential carbohydrate. There are essential proteins, and those are proteins, amino acids that we must consume. The, well, the word essential in nutrition means we must consume it. The body can't make it. So the essential amino acids are found in complete protein and complete protein is the animal version. So plant foods don't provide complete protein. Now you can combine and you can get pretty good, but most vegetarians and certainly vegans that I know don't know how to combine. They're not consciously thinking, oh, I should be mixing corn chips with um, beans because that's gonna complete the protein in a better way. And what you end up with, and I've looked at this in great detail, one of the posts on my website looked at eggs versus chickpeas. Because you're trying to sort of make up for one, usually, deficient amino acid, you end up with some of the others being too high. So you end up in a different balance. So it's not what the body was looking for. The body was looking for meat and fish and eggs and dairy to a lesser extent. So you need to go with that. And then you come to the final macronutrient, fat. And of course, there are essential fats. 
um, and the essential fats we call them omega-3 and omega-6 we get way too much omega-6 in the diet because that's very rich in vegetable oils that they've now decided all our food should be cooked in what we almost certainly don't get enough of are the omega-3s which is what we find in particularly oily fish um, and it, at a pinch public health dietary advice might say oh have oily fish a couple of times a week well if you look at what you actually need in terms of calcium um, vitamin d phosphorus um, omega-3s my recommendation would be somewhere around a 200 gram tin of sardines for example with bones and skin because that's where you're going to maximize the nutrients and the calcium particularly you're looking at a sort of 200 gram tin every single day not a thumb size you know the dietitians love saying don't they all oh, look too much protein you know not a thumb size of oily fish a couple of times a week and then they're trying to scare you about mercury and this that and the other whatever you know we, we need animal foods and we need them in quite decent proportions as well um you know the ideal diet to me would contain meat fish and eggs every day uh and if you don't eat any plants you're not going to suffer that much harm maybe a few sunflower seeds because i do think it's difficult to get vitamin e otherwise um, and of course nuts would contain vitamin e and selenium and that kind of thing um, but you really don't need to be eating fruit you absolutely do not need to be eating grains um, legumes are they have a, a pretty good nutritional profile often better than grains so if you're going to go for those sort of carbs go legumes rather than grains but compare a lentil with liver and liver is going to win every time. So they're OK, but they're not as good as something else you could be eating. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something earlier on. You said it's a crime that we don't teach our children uh, nutrition. There are no uh, nutrition classes. Um, <laughs> I was in education, I was an educator for 30 years uh, and I've taught in some of Britain's most um, famous private schools. There was no education on nutrition. I, I can guarantee you at no point did we even sit down and consider, hey, today's class discussion could possibly be about you know, healthy eating. In fact, there were occasions when healthy eating was mentioned as part of the circle time <laughs> for children. But then uh, guess where the resources would come from? Oh, the healthy eating plate, lots and lots of rice and grains and wheat and, uh, and possibly brown uh, wheat and bread and lots and lots of fruit. And then you would see meat right on the top. Yeah. Um, so I always avoided using those, those resources <laughs> and I'd end up creating my own whenever the opportunity came. But we don't have nutrition as part of our education system. It's sad. You've, you've named a big part of the problem there, because again, I've got another post on my site where we do, we don't teach nutrition, but we do mention nutrition. It's exactly that plate that you've just mentioned. So what I've always famously called the eat badly plate, they call it the eat well plate, or then it became the eat badly guide or the eat well guide. Um, and I had a look once at the school curriculum and it's probably a few years old now on my site, but it will only have got stronger. And I looked at how the eat badly plate had been embedded in the school curriculum. So at the age of seven, you should know this. and At the age of 11, you should know this. So all the way throughout school, it was being embedded in different lessons around the curriculum. So that, I mean, we, we run an online forum helping people to eat real food. Um, helping them with things like food addiction, helping them to just eat healthily and, and quite often, you know, they, they're coming in because they want to lose weight. And they say that their children have come home from school saying, oh, mummy, you're doing it all wrong. We're supposed to be having pasta and pizza and potatoes and rice for dinner. And you keep serving us meat and vegetables and so on. And then my poor club member has to educate the child and say, right, forget everything you've just learned in school. That is not healthy eating. That's a plate full of the one macronutrient that you don't need um and that is a, a recipe for obesity and diabetes which of course is what we've seen over the last 30 or so years zoe one of the books you've written and i think you mentioned this one uh, the obesity epidemic what caused it how can we stop it why do we overeat is another one when all you want is to be slim and you also have a book um, uh, stop counting calories and start losing weight. So let's just combine the main um, um, sort of the key element 
that combines all of these books. Okay, so Why yeah. Is it that counting calories doesn't, doesn't work? Mm -hmm. um, not all calories are the same, of course, we all know that. And I always say not all carbs are the same either. And <laughs> Um, you know, some of the people that I coach and say, oh, okay, so I'm having only 20, but that was like a small portion of pasta. That's all I had today. So 20 grams of carbs. Um, mm, that's not the point. It's not just about the carbs because not all carbs are the same. But I really want you to talk more about calories. And uh, uh, they obviously haven't worked because obviously the epidemic has gone worse and worse over the uh, past few decades. And why is it that people overeat? especially when they reduce calories yeah okay um gosh i'll try to do 20 years <laughs> it's probably longer actually 30 years of research in a few minutes um you've got to go back to the the, the root of the myth of the calorie theory and if you go on my site zoeharkham.com and you put in the search box prove it it will come up with a particular post that i wrote ages ago and it's basically about the biggest lie at the heart of the whole calorie theory which is this three and a half thousand calorie thing which you will still see now in men's health in women's magazines in books in government literature government studies are based on it this idea that if you cut back by three and a half thousand calories you will lose one pound of fat and i won't go into why it's so wrong because i go into it in that post it is just one of the biggest myths that we have ever been taught. And I stand up at conferences and I say, you know, I'm, I don't know, I'm under 110 pounds at the moment. You know, I have been for years. Um, keep the math simple. If I went on a calorie, you know, if I cut back by a thousand calories a day, then I'm supposed to be losing two pounds a week. So after 50 weeks, I'm supposed to have lost a hundred pounds. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm gone basically, or I'm gone way before because, you know, all my organs would have failed when all the fat was lost around them. Of course, that doesn't happen. Um, you've got people, um, people with anorexia who are eating an extraordinary little amount. And yes, anorexia is, is tragically one of the, it has the highest death rate of any um, condition that we kind of inflict on ourselves. It's an utterly tragic condition. Um, and about 20% of people with, with anorexia go on to die it really is is that serious but the fact that 80 percent don't that's the more interesting bit because they are you know why didn't everybody die um in war times and famine times and all the rest of it you know the body is incredibly resilient uh helping us to function on incredibly few calories so it adjusts is basically one of the big principles but the problem is when you start a go back to those three macronutrients so the one that you don't need is carbohydrate um, protein you absolutely do need in the right form fats you absolutely do need in the right form but of course we get taught that carbohydrate and protein have approximately four calories per gram and fat has approximately nine so as soon as you go on a calorie controlled diet you cut out fat now if you think of all the things that we eat as a sort of pie um, so you've got the protein, the fat and the carbohydrate. This is just a nutritional fact. I mean, I can give you theoretical um, references for it or empirical references for it, but just trust me for now. Protein tends to stay at around 15% of any natural diet. And interestingly, that's either a vegetarian diet or a um, more omnivore carnivore diet. So if you look globally, look at things like the pure study globally, you're going to be looking at about 15% protein. Yes. You've got people on keto carnivore. They're going up to 20%, perhaps even further North, um, than that, but you're in the 15 to 20% range. So that 80, 85% has to be taken up by the other two macronutrients. So 80 to 85% of your diet is going to be made up of fat and carbohydrate. So the minute the government tells you limit your intake of fat to no more than 30% of your calories, immediately you've just said, right, I'm going to eat 55% carbohydrate. Now, if you go on a calorie controlled diet and you realize that fat has nine calories per gram, every choice that you make is to get the biggest bang for your buck because you're frankly starving so when somebody says oh there's a tablespoon of olive oil or there's a packet of fruit gums and they're both 100 calories you're going to eat the packet of fruit gums and there's a um, piece of oily fish which might be 400 calories or you can have you know two 50 calorie yogurts four rice cakes packet of fruit gums and two small apples and make that last three hours you're just grazing what are you going to do so you know calorie counters just they go down the path of eating the wrong thing and why is it the wrong thing because it's not giving you the nutrients that you need it's taking you down the route of the macronutrient that you actually don't need to be eating at all you get hungry 
because your blood glucose level is absolutely going all over the place. You, have, you know, you have an apple, you've had about five times the amount of glucose that your body wants in the bloodstream at any one time. Um, and why do you overeat? Then basically looked at, okay, there are um, psychological reasons why we overeat and it explores our relationship with food and different emotions and childhood history and how sort of all roots lead to, if I eat some crap, it's gonna cheer me up, um, which is really not good. But there are also physical reasons why we overeat. So um, that book and Stop Counting Calories kind of got it down to um, things that are quite mainstream now, but back in 2004, they weren't. So hyperglycemia is one of them. You know, if you have an apple and your blood glucose level rises, the body's going to try and take the glucose out of the bloodstream if it doesn't take it out just perfectly. So you're kept in that narrow band. I mean, you know, absolutely the narrow band that you want to be keeping your glucose levels in. Usually it goes a little bit down below and then that's when you get hungry, which is why when you start eating biscuits or chocolate, you're in this this roller coaster and every time you dip down to the lower level your body will drive you to eat the next biscuit which will shoot you over and then your body will take you under and you're just so many people say oh I'm, I'm okay on my diet until I start eating the minute I start eating something during the day whether it's an apple or it's a croissant or a bowl of all bran which they think is healthy they're then on this roller coaster and they can't work out why so hyperglycemia is one reason that we're driven to overeat um, food intolerance was another area that I looked at, which is really interesting, because when you when you go for that bang for the buck, you realise that there is a right answer. You know, if you're having a 400 calorie lunch, the right answer probably is what I detail, which is four rice cakes, packet of fruit gums, two apples and two shaped yogurts or something, because it will give you the idea that you've had a lot for your calorie intake. So you have that every day and you get addicted to it your body just gets you know food intolerance is about having the same things too much too often so your body just gets intolerant to those substances but at the same time you're you're becoming addicted to them you're getting cravings for them so you actually start feel feeling bad when you don't have them so um you know if somebody has a muffin on the way to work every day and then they decide they're going to go on a diet and they don't have the muffin the first day they walk into work and they don't have the muffin they feel terrible they're getting physical withdrawal symptoms and that's all tied up in things like food intolerance, food addiction. And I explain that that is also driving cravings that are making people overeat. And then the third one, I looked at it as one particular gut flora, but I mean, gut flora is everything now, isn't it? It's the whole fiber thing. I looked at it particularly from the point of candida albicans. So I was reading books like the yeast syndrome. Could candida be your problem? You know, I was reading these um, when I was working in the US and th these weren't even being talked about in the UK. I was working in the US in the 90s, just, you know, out there on my own, didn't know anyone. When work had finished, I'd just wander off to the local bookstore and they would just let you buy Starbucks in the bookstore and read the books. I mean, it was nothing like that in the UK. So I just digested so much about, you know, I'd look at books that talk to me because I was suffering food cravings at the time. You know, could yeast be your problem? Hyperglycemia, could this be your problem? And then just kind of pieced it all together to say, okay, there are some physical strong drivers as to why we overeat. And actually starting a calorie controlled diet takes you down the path of all of them. So, you are just in this vicious cycle that's going to get worse and worse and worse in terms of hyperglycemia, candida, um, food intolerance, to the point that you will feel monumentally addicted to food. And that's why you start every day with really good intentions and then find yourself eating muffins and um, fruit gums and thinking, oh, you know, I've only eaten 1500 calories, it wasn't so bad, but you ate 1500 completely useless calories that your body didn't actually need and you didn't eat the 1500 calories that your body did need, which was red meat and oily fish and eggs, particularly yolks, full fat dairy, a few green things and some seeds. Zoe, you mentioned the hyperglycemia and uh, well, it's obvious that the calorie counting, uh, calorie counting sort of diet that's based on calorie counting does not address uh, the issue of hunger, yeah. the issue of blood sugars and the issue of satiety. Yeah. So these are not addressed and these are important when it comes to to eating and of course doesn't calorie counting doesn't address um uh, food cravings and food addictions either so <laughs> so it can be a very useful tool and um, can we also then say that calorie counting is not a sustainable 
Oh, I, I totally, yeah. yeah. It's not sustainable. Yeah. I totally believe that it isn't, you know, that the human body is just not designed to tolerate hunger. It just isn't, you know, we, we've evolved to find food and hunger drives us to find food. Um, and it's been our entire purpose in at periods throughout our um, anthropological history, finding food has been our entire purpose of each day, avoid being food for something else, some other wild animal, and then find food for yourself. And that's, that's what we needed to do to live. And then suddenly we're in this modern world where there's more food than we can ever possibly imagine 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, deliberately designed to tempt us. We see adverts all over the place designed to tempt us. It really, it would take the willpower of, you know, I don't know, someone like Victoria Beckham maybe or something to resist food in that kind of world. And most people can't do it. Um, and you look at things like the, the, the two clear options that we've got now for type two diabetes. And of course you've got the Roy Taylor, Newcastle, um, Mike Lean approach, which is, you know, the, the milkshakes, the very low calorie, low fat, high carbohydrate, um, normal protein, uh, low fat milk shakes, which just happen to have all the nutrients added, but they're trying to get you at around 800 calories a day. Or of course, you've got the low carb approach, um, which is cut the carbs and you don't really need to worry too much about the rest. Um, don't go mad. I do get really annoyed with the sort of low carb world when it's saying, oh, you know, put smother butter on your steak, you know, it's going to make your pants fall down or something you're going to lose so much weight you're not if you're trying to burn body fat don't go add in dietary fat because your body will first of all it wants to burn carbs if you cut those out great it's then going to start looking for fat to burn but you want it to be burning your body fat not dietary fat so don't go nuts on dietary fat either don't don't fear it you don't have to be cutting the the fat off your steak that's part of what you should be eating that's part of a normal meal um but seeing people at conferences who are two or three times my size putting butter on their steak i just why are you doing that that's not going to help anyone yeah i know that because uh, i never had any weight to lose but um, i realized that i actually needed more fat because I don't have any body fat to lose and I'm doing resistance training. I'm getting better and better at it. I'm lifting heavier weights now. So I realize I need more fat. <laughs> Unlike the yeah. people I coach who are basically doing it to lose fat, I need yeah. more fat to fuel my body. And it made all the difference for me when you said butter on steak. Yeah. I actually put butter on my steak because otherwise it's just not sufficient. I'm fatigued and tired. I don't have enough energy. So and that for you is perfect. You know, I, I, I've had the privilege of sitting next to people like Steve, Professor Steve Finney, um, Sarah Halberg, um, uh, Christine Cronow, you know, Tim Noakes, um, Jay Waltman, Jeff Joe. You know, I have the privilege of sitting next to these people at conference dinners. Um, and Steve Finney and, and Prof Noakes were massively into exercise, but ended up with type 2 diabetes, having carb loaded for such a long period of time. And they are um, so lean, um, you know, they are naturally lean because they're avoiding carbohydrate. Um, and they absolutely, because they're still running, you know, I think Tim is still running marathons, they're still out jogging and doing masses of exercise. They need to put fuel onto their plate, but I'm particularly interested in the ones who want to be losing weight, need to be losing weight who are then looking at people like that at the conferences and thinking, oh, that's the way to end up column-like like they are. Um, it's like, no, they were always kind of column-like. They ended up with a little bit of the, the type two diabetes spare tire, which is when they realized that's what they had. And they now manage their type two diabetes with a very low carbohydrate diet um, and fat for fuel, just like you. But the people trying to lose weight don't need to be adding fat on top of normal fat in a normal food. So I'm going to uh, go back to something else you mentioned. Uh, you were giving the example of an apple, uh, apple. And for most people, your blood sugars would rise. I know that as a type 1 diabetic because I will have to take insulin yeah. uh, for an apple if I ever eat an apple. I mean, I don't know. I haven't eaten an apple for <laughs> seven years. Um, and then blood sugars, of course, start dropping down. And that's exactly what would happen in a non-diabetic person, except that they don't, they're not wearing the CGM like I do, and, and they don't have an insulin pump, obviously, so they can't see how much insulin their pancreas is pumping out. Um, 
and and they're not aware of how high their blood sugars are going. But one example I always give on this channel is that as after an apple or a, or a meal of pasta or bread, as the blood sugars rise, sharp rise, and then they start dropping sharply, as they're dropping down, before I even get to hypoglycemic levels, as they're dropping down, I start feeling hungry again and shaky and dizzy and I get back to the fridge and I, I, I and even at figures which aren't technically hypoglycemic, I would feel like I could just empty, devour the whole fridge right now. And that's, that's that hunger, that craving is a feeling you cannot control. You cannot control. It's such a good point there. That's a really good point that it's not just the level, it's actually whether it's falling or rising. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's the same when it goes the other way. So you'll find um, pe people who, um, eat chocolate quite regularly or something, you know, they might have a confectionery bar and immediately they feel that they could run the country, take on the world. There's just this surge in sugar, literally energy. They feel energetic, they feel powerful, but that surge up. So you haven't hit the big heights yet, but just the on the way up is having an effect. The height then also has an effect, but you're so right to remind us that on the way down, as well as the, the depth, the dip are the two bad periods when and and you physically get the symptoms um you get them as a diabetic my brother gets them as a diabetic but i've seen dieters get them when they're not managing their blood glucose levels and they get clammy hands and they get a bit shaky hands a little bit sweaty mm -hmm. um can't concentrate can't think of anything other than food how do you expect to be able to get through your job and work and pick the kids up from school and make dinner and all the rest of it when you're just on this glucose roller coaster all day long mm -hmm. and you're snacking all day long which only makes the problem worse yeah. ah so um so your brother is also a type 1 diabetic and i know you've mentioned that he doesn't mind uh, you know being being mentioned in podcasts i mean a lot of my followers are type 1 diabetics um um tell us how he's uh, is he is he uh, has he taken interest in low low carbohydrate diet yeah um too late though i would say i mean we really have been trying for quite a, a long period of time interestingly when my brother was first diagnosed um the diet advice wasn't that bad um so i can remember being um you know sort of younger sister um he'd gone to some scout jamboree camp it was absolutely classic but it just wasn't diabetes just wasn't sort of so much in the news um, when he was a teenager. So he'd gone to the Scout Jamboree looking really, really healthy, came back and he'd lost a stone in three weeks. Um, and it was the summer holidays and my mum was um, teaching swimming a lot. So she was still down at the local school, even though it was closed for the summer, she was teaching swimming. So my brother was, you know, sort of the main person in the house and he'd be sending me up to the shops to get fizzy pop um, because he had just this insatiable thirst. And it was like no sooner got back from the shop um, and he was saying, you know, can you go and get me another bottle? So I'm just on my bike all day long. And I got back one day from cycling back from the shops and there was a little note on the floor from my mum saying, um, take an Adrian to hospital. Um, dad will be home soon. So I just sort of wait there and then dad comes home and then we all went up the hospital. Um, and it was kind of like, okay, Adrian's now type one diabetic. Um, and then the whole family had to learn about glucose and insulin and how to recognize hyperglycemia how to recognize hypo because obviously it was really important that we did the right thing um, and didn't start trying to you know shove glucose into him if he was hyper um, and our diet did change um, you know I remember quite significantly and um, the advice was quite good it was very much more oh you should be eating more meat and vegetables and um, my parents have got roots in Wales but they were brought up in um, the northeast and it was very much the sort of the high tea you'd have, you know, you'd have a Sunday roast and then at 4.30 in the afternoon, you'd be having Battenberg cake and scones and cream and jam and biscuits and whatever had been baked that morning when the Sunday roast was on, it was just kind of how it was. It's kind of all of that has to go. Um, and I loved all of that, you know, all the biscuits and the cakes, or whatever, so that all went, that was a bit of a, bit of a bummer. Um, but it seemed to be quite good. And then I don't quite know, because I wasn't in his consultations, I don't quite know at one point the Eat Badly plate just completely took over and then they just decided that was for everyone. 
and then it was all oh, you know you really shouldn't be eating so much meat because um all oh, you know it's got fat in it you know it's got monounsaturated fat more than saturated but that's a separate issue um you shouldn't be eating so much of that you should be having pizza and pasta and just manage it with insulin and my niece's friend has just been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and I was chatting to her about it because my niece is very um, sort of on board. She sees how me and my husband eat and how her dad eats. Um, and she was talking about her friend and she said, oh, M um, won't say her name, has just been told, have whatever you want, but just kind of insulin will sort it out. And I'm like, no, I can't believe at 15, they're still giving out this kind of advice. Um, but Adrian definitely lapsed into... Um, oh, I should be having porridge for breakfast because it's so slow release carbohydrate and um, I need some carbohydrate with lunch because if not, my glucose is going to go too low. Um, and it's just trying to educate him and there's still a little bit of it going on. He's, he's had so many years of indoctrination that at the weekend we were up there and he was out doing some physical work and I think his glucose was quite high before he went out. So I think he gave a little bit of extra, um, you know, gave a little pump of insulin. And then, of course, came back in from the garden and he's he's in low, he's, he's in his um, glucose of 3.2. Um, so then he's thinking, well, the only thing I can do now to get it back up to some something normal, because he's feeling quite unwell at that point, is to have a biscuit. It's like you should not be having a biscuit as a type 1 diabetic and you should not be putting insulin in because your glucose is high. You need to be a making sure that your glucose doesn't get high in the first place or recognizing that glucagon still works. You know, that's the thing that people don't seem to realize. You haven't shut off glucagon, type 1 diabetics or type 2 diabetics. Glucagon is still working fine. So you always have this mechanism of actually putting glucose back into the bloodstream. Now, I remember my hubby and I were actually talking at dinner. It's uncanny saying we remember where we were in the car with Professor Tim Noakes when he was talking about this. And he said, of course, the person who solves diabetes will be the person who solves how to control glucagon because you can control every other means of putting glucose into the body what you can't control is the endogenous glucose production and diabetics know they quite often have the morning dawn so you wake up in the morning and your glucose is actually quite high because your body naturally at about four o'clock in the morning it's looking around for fuel if you're naturally low carb it's not finding any carbohydrate great your body does what it's then supposed to do at, at that time of the morning which is to say okay glucagon go and put me some glycerol back into the bloodstream, break down a bit of body fat, we'll give you it back later on, don't worry. And, and that's the cycle that should work. But of course, with the type one diabetic, it doesn't have the insulin then to counter the glucagon going back in, they then panic seeing that the glucose is quite high and start pumping more insulin in. You know, the best thing that you can probably do is morning exercise. So you've got glucose that's been put in, take it out. And don't put more in at breakfast. Well, I did that just yesterday. Well, I fast in the morning, so I don't have morning meal. And I go to the gym. And I don't have the dawn phenomenon every single morning. So I can't really adjust my, my pump settings to pump me every single morning a little more insulin because some days I would drop. It just, I don't have that dawn phenomenon every single day, which makes, uh, you know, the, if, <laughs> type 1 diabetes even more complicated. Um, and so I just have to wake up and see if I keep keep rising for no reason. I know that it's done. And I wake up very, very early, like from 5, 5 a.m. So I know that it's done phenomenon. It's just my blood sugars are rising. It doesn't happen every morning. Some mornings it does. And it's not related to my evening meal of the previous day because, you know, I've ruled that one out. So it's done phenomenon, but it doesn't hit me every single morning. And so I wait for blood sugars to rise and then take a small amount of insulin it takes time for it to work though um you know, at any other time in the day it would work more effectively than that morning but i don't overdo it uh and just give it time and then eventually blood sugar would normalize so but when you mentioned exercise if i'm going for a for for a bike ride for example then i wouldn't take i won't take that insulin because bike ride or any aerobic exercise will bring bring the high down but unfortunately, in the mornings and fasted state, um, I go for a moderately strenuous resistance training, which usually for me anyway, um, you know, uh, uh, raises my blood sugars. 
yeah. Oh, yesterday. Yeah. Oh, so <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, yeah, that's the other time that glucagon is going to kick in. It's going to, uh, you don't have carbs readily available because you're low carb. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, it'd be interesting if you had some pure fat before exercise, whether it would then start, you'd have to time it just right to have the sort of circulating fatty acids because the body wakes up glucagon. And of course, when glucagon is giving you the fat that you need for fuel it's also because it's got the backbone of glycerol it's giving you some glucose at the same time i'm just thinking out loud here i wonder if just having a couple of tablespoons of of coconut oil or something before but the other thing is do you drink you probably don't do you Um, you i don't drink alcohol no not alcohol Uh, alcohol is another very interesting one that I was sat next to David Unwin once at a conference in Switzerland and um, it was a really nice conference with Swiss Re and a gorgeous building, fantastic meal. And this wine was being passed around that was clearly really nice wine. And I sat next to David and he said, oh God, just look at that, that looks amazing. I said, well, have a glass. And he said, well, I can't, I'm type two diabetic. And I said, well, what do you think is gonna happen? And he said, well, you know, grape juice, or whatever, it's gonna impact my glucose. I said, it is, but it's gonna go down. And he said, well, how's that going to work? And I said, well, alcohol inhibits the operation of glucagon. So you're not going to eat many carbs at the meal because I know how you eat. You're keto, virtually carnivore. So the alcohol is going to start acting on your glucagon and inhibiting its operation. And he has his thing as well. So he did his thing and he sort of held it up to the table. And then he went for the wine and he had half a glass of wine, did his thing, and it's going down. (laughs) He had a bit more wine and his thing is going down. I said, now you know what this does, you need to use this very, very carefully because it is another way of lowering your blood glucose level. Um, But you have to be careful because, you know, particularly as a type one, you have now just potentially taken away your one ability to get your glucose level back to normal. So, you know, if my brother took too much insulin, let's say, um, before his evening meal, didn't then have enough carbohydrate in the evening meal, let's say was tired and just wasn't really concentrating, went to bed early, the thing that he would most fear would be lapsing into some sort of hypo coma overnight, particularly when you're newly diagnosed. That's, you know, that's one of the biggest fears. How high glucose is going to damage you over the long term. That's the thing that's going to give you diabetic retinopathy and lose your eyesight and lose your limbs and all the rest of it. So that's one worry. But the immediate short term worry is not high glucose, it's low glucose. And trying to explain to him, your glucagon still working. As long as you don't absolutely knock it out with insulin, you know, as long as you're not wearing background insulin at the same time, um, your your body will start glucagon will do its thing you, the, the glucagon can't act while insulin's there they're, they're obviously antagonists so that's why i say as long as you haven't knocked out the chance of glucagon because you've taken so much insulin um but at some point you know the insulin subsides or whatever and glucagon can come forward and do its thing and that's when your glucose is going to naturally rise so your body does have a mechanism to save you from this sort of dreaded hypo that so many type ones particularly fear um so what i was then saying to to david unwin was you're a type two you're not a type one but you still don't want to be waking up in the morning with glucose levels at three because you're just going to feel a bit rubbish and it's not terribly healthy either um but now you know what red wine does and you enjoy red wine you've got a tool it's up to you how you want to use it. And he, I got a message from his wife, Jen, under the table going, oh, my God, what have you done with my husband? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> he's, he's come back able to share a bottle of wine with you. Don't worry. Everything's going to be OK. Mm-hmm. But um, alcohol's fascinating with diabetes. It is. And uh, with red wine, what I notice is immediate rise. And then, of course, later on, two, three, four hours later, I start dipping, um, but the uh, the unpredictably unpredictability with glucagon is yes we know it's there and it saves us from a hypo because it happens in my sleep yeah. if I've dipped and then yeah. I notice that like four or five hours later or six hours later um, I'm back up again back to normal and that's yeah. glucagon that's just done its job I didn't wake up I didn't tackle the hypo uh, and I'm not talking about severe hypo but generally like 3.4 3.3 and then eventually it would go back up to over four um, and that's that's my normal or just 4.5 4.4 I feel at my best um, but you can't rely on it 
you can't because you don't know when it's going to work or how fast and if you are awake and you are 3.4 and you are craving food and you're not able to concentrate you can't just sit back and take no action and think oh glucagon is going to save me now it's yeah. difficult yeah. but it should also be you know when you think that in your entire body at any one time you're supposed to have one teaspoon four grams mm -hmm. of glucose and then you see, um, you know, my brother at 3.2 wanted to have a couple of chocolate digestives or something. It's like, no, you've got to be thinking that you're at three and you want to be at four. You're looking for a gram of glucose from somewhere. You're not looking for an apple. Um, you know, a square of dark chocolate, 85% dark chocolate for me is one of the, the, the best kind of little tools that you could always have in your handbag. And I would say that for non-diabetic people as well. So I do... You know, one of the tips that we'd give dieters in the club, we'd say, oh, do you notice that when you're out drinking or you're going out for a night out with friends and that's the only time that the fish and chip van or the kebab van looks attractive because, you know, in the daylight you would never go for it. But at 11 o'clock at night or one o'clock in the morning, you're ravenous. Why are you ravenous? Because you've been drinking all evening. So you've stopped your body getting the glucose um, levels back to normal using glucagon but have a little tiny bar of dark chocolate in your handbag and you probably only need one square of 85% and it's going to nudge you from three grams to four grams. And then just suddenly you're back in that normal range and you don't need a bag of chips. You know, the bag of chips is probably going to be 300 grams of carbohydrate and how any body can, ever, you know, any human body, not any person, how, how the body can ever cope with that kind of onslaught of carbohydrate. I just don't know. You see with the, diabetes care when I was on a high carbohydrate diet. Um, and um, of course, I wasn't advised to lower my carbs for better uh, A1C control. I was just told my A1C was high, and that I should be doing better, I should be more smart with my pump options and take insulin up front and then try or oh, no, take take it 30 minutes later, 30 minutes earlier, all these lessons, I've tried them all, nothing would work, I just could not really stop after pizza, I couldn't stop my blood sugars from rising and then they would drop sharply. And then I would need, you know, I would need to eat French or fries pizza. or whatever, yeah, <laughs> more, more carbs. But yeah. Um, so um, yeah, my high, high, high carb days. So uh, we were recommended uh, leucosate um, uh, drinks. Course, yeah. and I know other type one diabetics would just gulp the whole drink down. That's hundreds of grams of glucose. What I do now, I understand how little glucose I need. And because my normal is just so low anyway, um, a glucose tab, a single glucose tab contains about four grams of, um, of pure glucose. And I have it in quarters. I just literally cut it into quarters. So one gram at a time, and I notice the difference. So if one gram didn't work in 10 minutes time, I check again or 15 minutes. No, then I'll take another one. That's literally just two grams of ins, um, pure sugar, glucose, to bring me from a 3.4, 3.2 to back to four or 4.1. Um, yeah. And I'll put all the conversions on the screen later on for our American audience. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. But we do, we, you're so right. We need very little sugar to bring our glucose back up to normal. We just, we, we never, we never taught that. No one ever teaches us that. Our diabetes consultants don't tell us that. Yeah, yeah. It's sad. Yeah. It's criminal. <laughs> it's not just sad, it's criminal. It's killing people. It's shortening lives. And it's causing diabetics, um, the, the younger they get, and of course, we're getting type two now younger and younger as well. Uh, you are shortening your life and you're risking diabetics now being in their 70s, 60s, even with amputated limbs, with eye damage, um, with loss of sensation in their fingers. So perhaps they can't do piano playing or knitting or keyboards, whatever they, they want to be doing. You know, we're, we're seriously harming people with this advice. It's just criminal. Yeah, and I think it's very sad that now type 1s are also developing type 2 or insulin resistance. So type 1s used to be called the skinny, the skinny diabetics. Yeah. But that's no longer the case. Type 1s are now developing, growing bigger because they're taking massive or unlimited amounts of insulin if they're not controlling the carbs and then they become eventually insulin resistant and, uh, and then they become vulnerable to all the other complications that typically type two diabetics would be um, uh, 
vulnerable to. Yeah. Right. So we talked about obesity. Uh, we talked about uh, calorie counting. Let's talk more about carbohydrates. Now we're talking about type one diabetes, but even outside the circle of type one diabetes, which carbohydrates are the most helpful for people to eat if they are going to eat? You, you mentioned the grains. Grains shouldn't have a place in healthy human nutrition yeah. because they are not nutrient dense. Yeah, right? yeah. They also play havoc on your blood sugars, whether you actually measure it or realize it or not. Yeah. Um, and part of the carbohydrate uh, uh, conversation, I'd like you to also mention fiber. Is fiber essential in human nutrition? No. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's just simple logic again, going back to the math. So you've got the three macronutrients, carbohydrates, fat, and protein. Essential means something you must consume. There are essential fats. We've covered those two. There are essential proteins. We've covered those, amino acids. There are no essential carbohydrates. And fiber is a carbohydrate. So if you then break down carbohydrates, so carbohydrate will break down into what we call monosaccharides, which is your glucose and fructose. You've got disaccharides. So sucrose, table sugar, is one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose. So you've taken two monosaccharides and you've got a disaccharide. So when you get into things like polysaccharides, which basically just translates into many sugars. So remember that word saccharide, you know, monosaccharide, one sugar, disaccharide, two sugars, sugar, 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 carbohydrate, carbohydrate, carbohydrate. you know, they are, they are one and the same thing. Polysaccharides, many carbohydrates, and you've got um, polysaccharides in the form of glycogen, which is the storage form of carbohydrate. Um, you've got uh, digestible carbohydrates and you've got indigestible, sorry, digestible polysaccharides and indigestible polysaccharides. And fiber is essentially indigestible polysaccharides. So many sugars that you cannot digest. And then you have various forms of those. So they'll, people will talk about soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. So soluble fiber will be something that swells or dissolves in water. So you think of your porridge in the morning and you put the oats in milk and warm them in the microwave and it all kind of blends in into this mush. So that's oats are a soluble fiber. Um, but then if you think of something like um, what would be a different example? I mean, um, ling lignins or whatever or brands in some way. I mean, if you put um, lentils even um, and sort of just try to stir them in with milk without heating them in some kind of way, they're just going to stay in their form. Um, you know, they're, they're not going to change. And in fact, they stay pretty much in their form, even when you do try to swell them a little bit in water. But I mean, essentially, the fiber is under the umbrella of many sugars that you can't digest. So immediately, you should be thinking, if there's something that I can't digest, why am I eating it? And it, the massive explosion that we've got, I mean, the number of people taking Rene's, the number of pe people taking antacids, over the, you know, prescription antacids, as well as over the counter ones, a number of people who will report having irritable bowel syndrome or tum tummy upsets, feeling bloated after eating, feeling uncomfortable after eating, almost certainly the fiber that you're eating. There was a great study done over in Asia. Um, it was probably, I think, only about 60 to 80 people, um, but big enough to be powered to have significant results. And they took people who reported um, high levels of, of essentially bowel discomfort. So they were having um diarrhea or constipation bloating irritable bowel syndrome pain you know they, they were scoring high on every level of bowel discomfort and they took them off all fiber and then they asked them to repeat the questionnaires you know what level of discomfort are you having in constipation and diarrhea da, 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 da. and then at the end of the study they said right do you want to go back onto fiber and virtually every person stayed off fiber it's like everything was fixed all of my bloating, all of my pain, all of my problems, everything was fixed when they went off fiber. And there are so many powerful studies like this. You know, if, if I had somebody who was reporting gastric distress, the first thing I would say to them is just cut down on, you know, I'm, this is not advice. I should probably say this. I'm, you know, I'm a researcher, not your doctor. But, you know, if it were me or my loved one, I can advise my husband. If my husband had come to me saying, you know, I'm suffering all of that. I mean, he hardly eats any fiber. He would have cut back on fiber. Um, now you will, whenever you change your diet, you go on holiday, you change your diet, you go and stay with someone, you change your diet. Everyone will know when you change your diet in that very short term, you tend to feel a little bit different. 
So you go on holiday and maybe you get diarrhea or maybe you get constipation anyway. So you've got to give it a bit of time to see that it's not just things have changed. But then, you know, after a few days heading into a week or two, then then you start noticing the difference. But there is absolutely no human requirement for fiber whatsoever. So the next question you ask is, OK, we don't need it, but surely it's good for us. It's, well, why it's is it good for us? Gut bacteria, that's what people say, right? I mean, that's that's so, understanding. <laughs> yeah, so there are so many things that are better for your gut flora. Remember, I was writing about this back in 2004 and I was researching it back in the 90s and reading the books on it back then. There are so many things that are better for your gut flora than beans on toast. And may I suggest that beans on toast is really not going to help because it's basically sugar, which is what the polysaccharides is. So what do you want to do if you want great gut flora? First of all, and you don't get to do this, but you want great parents your parents health has a real bearing on your health, you ideally want to be born vaginally, not through cesarean, because then you're getting flushed through with your mum's um, gut flora as you're coming out into this world, that's the best little start that you can get, you want to be best breastfed um, as long as possible, you want mum to be having a good variety of real food while she's breastfeeding you, I know you can't control all of those, even when you start getting on to the next stage, which is don't take antibiotics as a child unless your life depends on it. You know, again, that's going to rely on mum and dad having good advice in terms of health care. You know, he's got a head cold. He doesn't need antibiotics. Stop it. Um, so all of those sort of childhood things can stand you in really good stead. But then look at all the other things that feed great gut flora so it's have a real food diet processed food is going to destroy it don't take antibiotics when you're older unless your life depends on it you know they're not smart it's they're serious drugs dairy i mean the lactobacillus all the gut flora um, in the natural world comes in dairy products so be having natural live yogurt be having blue cheeses consider having raw milk i know that's quite controversial but there are so many sources um kefir which has become far more popular um, fantastic for gut gut flora and you will find you almost feel like you're having a colonic irrigation I mean it does really have a bit of a flushing effect um, but it's not fiber it's, it's dairy it's it's fat and protein you know it's not there's a tiny bit of carbohydrate in it but it's not a fibrous food in any way shape or form so all of that and you still don't need to go near fiber now carbohydrates back to the original question which are better than others if you're always choosing your food for the nutrients it for so my, so my three rules for eating, number one, eat real food. Number two, choose that food for the nutrients it provides. And number three, eat a maximum of three times a day, unless you're an athlete, a child or whatever, that, that's a good guide. The second one, choose that food for the nutrients it provides, will always push you down the route of choosing animal foods. Because every time you've got a choice, lentils or liver, it's gonna be liver um all bran or eggs it's going to be eggs pasta or oily fish for dinner it's going to be oily fish it's always going to be the animal foods because that's where you find the nutrients in the form that we need them now there are nutrients in plants i've mentioned sunflower seeds and vitamin e useful um nuts can also be um useful sources of a number of nutrients you just have to watch the fat carb mix if you're someone trying to lose weight and then green things tend to be pretty good. I mean, there's definitely things in the salad, vegetable world, particularly if you've grown them yourself or you know where they come from. Um, and of course, then you've got non-starchy veg more than starchy veg. Um, I'm low carb relative to the government advice. I'm not particularly low carb relative to the low carb world. So I wouldn't have a problem having a um, having legumes. You can, you can get some, you know, or tabouleh or something. You know, you can get some really tasty dishes that have got those kind of things in them. They're not going to cause me any problems. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind having them. I love fruit. I've always love fruit. But every time I eat a piece of fruit, I'm aware that I could be eating something that's more nutritious. So I'm aware I'm making a conscious choice to have something because I like the taste, not because it's the healthiest thing that I could be consuming. And then you've got to start saying, is that a trade-off that I'm prepared to make and I'm slim I'm I feel good the way I eat so you know I don't worry about having a fruit platter if I'm on holiday and the fruit looks spectacular um I just wouldn't have it every day and I wouldn't kid myself that it's healthier than the eggs and the yogurt that I probably should have had instead for breakfast I'm I'm honest with myself uh, you often, uh, I think you've uh, you've written about this too. Nutrient focus on nutrient density for um, uh, for weight loss. Yeah. <laughs> so for anyone interested in weight loss, focusing on nutrient dense. 
foods is is the way to go for, for all of us. In fact, for, for me as a type one diabetic too. So, and I think I have to add here, the most nutrient dense foods have the least impact on my blood sugars. Yeah, they're the, they're the animal foods. And that's the problem with the vegans. So the only zero carb foods on the planet, I mean, forget, you know, there's a little bit of glycogen in liver if the animal had some glycogen at the time that it was killed. But think essentially of meat as zero carbohydrate, fish, zero carbohydrate, eggs have got a trace, but they're pretty much zero carbohydrate. Dairy starts to get a little bit more interesting. Hard cheese, very low fluid dairy like milk much higher you can be getting up towards sort of 10 percent carbohydrate um so you know you, you do need to sort of look at those but if you're because those are the most nutrient dense foods they are naturally the low carbohydrate foods um, and then if you're looking at the green veg rather than the starchy veg you're making a better veg choice because you know you've got good nutrients in each but you've just got higher carbohydrate in the carrots so um, bang for buck, you're getting more in the green things and the peppers and the, um, if you're okay with cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, that kind of thing, um, you're getting better nutrients in those, you know, sort of gram for gram or calorie for calorie, sugar for sugar than you would in things like the starchy vegetables. Um, so yeah, f focus on where the nutrients are. You will naturally be low carb. You will naturally be satiated because you're giving the body the nutrients it needs. I mean, you went, when you were that calorie counter and you had the rice cakes and the fruit gums and the two apples because you were getting your bang for the buck, the body still sat there saying, but I need all those 13 vitamins and I need all those, you know, probably 16 to 20 minerals. Minerals are more variable, the, the essential ones. Um, and I didn't get them. So I'm going to make you crave them until you start giving me what I need. And what it really wanted was salmon and green beans with liver pate for starch or something but it didn't get that so you you're just constantly hungry looking for the nutrients that your body's trying to get you to get i loved reading that it is actually the nutrient density that your body craves every time you eat and when you've reached your nutrient sort of optimal level you feel satiated. So I read that somewhere. I, think, I can't remember whether it was um, um, uh, Dr. Bickman, uh, Ben Bickman, who said that. So uh, we sounds like yeah. Tend to wonder. Yeah, it's one of his his sorts of things. <laughs> um, um, so we tend to think, oh, is it the fat? Or should I add the butter? Should I? It's it's actually the nutrient density. It's the whole. It's not just the fat or the protein or whatever or uh, uh, the protein shape, for example. So mm -hmm. no, eat your meat get all the nutrients with the iron and potassium and everything in it, then your body will feel satiated. Do and that's one of the that? other, yeah, one of, one of the other things about butter is it's not all that. Um, you know, if you look at a steak and it's given you, you know, the fat soluble vitamins, it's given you fantastic B vitamins, it's given you iron, um, you know, it's given you zinc, it's given you some really valuable minerals and vitamins. Butter just isn't all that. I mean, butter is not going to give you any minerals of any value. Um, and it gives you sort of vitamin A and vitamin D. Um, and then if you look at things more like the plant oils, they tend to give you E and K. So, you know, if you had a bit of olive oil and a bit of butter, you're getting all the fat soluble nutrients, but you would get them naturally in the fish and the meat. So, you know, people who need the butter or um, coconut oil or something for, as we said earlier, exercise fuel, that's one thing. Um, but just piling it on your steak, thinking it's giving you some benefit. If you're missing nutrients, then add liver to your steak or add a bit of oily fish to your steak. Don't add butter to your steak because it's just, it's just bringing fat, basically. Just, it's not that nutritious. Well, steak and eggs have always yeah, had a combination, good combination. Uh, yeah, very French, yeah. <laughs> No, I didn't realize it was French steak and eggs. But, uh, yeah, there's um, oh, my husband would know the dish because he lived in France for three years. But they they have a sort of raw steak. I mean, it's just it's not even cooked because they love their meat really rare over in France. It's just like a red piece of uncooked meat, and then they chuck a couple of eggs on top. Um, yeah, it's some your your listeners will know what the word is. They'll put it in the show notes or something. But it's not my good. idea of a great meal. But no, but a well cooked steak, which is what I can just about stomach now, uh, cut in tiny slices. So I'm still new to this transition, meat eating transition. I only started last year. So um, 
But it sure is a delicious combination, steak and eggs together. I have that for my first meal of the day. So uh, about you know 12 o'clock or something. But I am going to try what you mentioned earlier. I'm going to wrap up very, very soon. But I'm going to try uh, giving myself extra fuel, extra fat in the morning to oh, yeah. see if I can then avoid that you know, massive glucagon uh, sort of response. Um, yeah, okay, interesting. 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 Yeah. I'll let you know the results. I will definitely try it, but technically it will break my fast because I fast throughout the morning. It will be breaking my fast if I'm adding butter to my coffee. I, I used to do that. I used to I, I have black coffee, but I can very happily add coconut oil to it um, or butter, for mm -hmm. example. Do you have coffee before you exercise? So you're fasting, but do you have coffee before you exercise? Yes, I do. I do. And is it caffeinated or decaffeinated? It's fully caffeinated. <laughs> so you're, you're stimulating glucagon? With caffeine. caffeine. caffeine but then if I'm having it in bed, and I, I usually have my coffee in bed, so I don't really, and if I'm staying in bed and I'm doing my work in bed on a cold day, day cold day, for example, uh, then I don't get that response. I don't get a spike. Okay. I mean, that, that would be another, you, you, you've got to do a controlled experiment here. So oh. one, you've got to try and do it. And I know it'd be really difficult because caffeine you know, gets me going in the morning, um, but caffeine should stimulate glucagon. It sends you into that flight fright response to which glucagon is going to respond. Um, so it should stimulate fat breakdown, which for people trying to lose weight, that's great. But of course, for you, what comes with it is the glycerol that comes with the, the triglyceride. So that would be first interesting experiment would be trying it with decaf coffee um, and then having the caffeine to sort of kick you into touch when you come back from the exercise. And then the second one would be to um, when you've worked out what the caffeine does to see what happens if, as you say, you add butter to the coffee or coconut oil to the coffee or mct oil or something like that um or even just tablespoon you know tablespoon of olive oil whatever just obviously not the high polyunsaturated oils because they're not good for us but yeah that'd be interesting that's interesting and i'll let you know uh yeah, i do I'm yeah very excited to try it tomorrow tomorrow morning <laughs> okay well dr harcom zoe thank you so much for your time oh, thank you very really much it's been really enjoyable isn't it on a what <laughs> looks now like a wintry evening but uh, uh, i really enjoyed the conversation hopefully we can do this again some other time and talk about okay. um evidence uh, uh versus dogma okay that sounds <laughs> good how do we do yeah an hour and a quarter that's not bad is it yeah no so thank you very much bye for now thank you as well bye